Now that you understand a little bit more about your computer's file directory structure, we're going to talk some about file path names and how you can explain to R how to get to files saved in different locations. So when you need to reference a directory or a file from R, if it's in your working directory, you're fine. You just use the name of the file. If it's not directly in that directory, though, if it's either in a subdirectory of it or if it's in another directory in your computer, then you have to give um, R some directions. You have to give it a path to get there, which we call a file path. There are two different ways that you can give file paths in R and in general if you're working on kind of a Unix or Linux type system. One of those is with a relative pathway. That explains from where I am right now, the working directory I'm in right now, how do you get to the file that I want you to get? The other thing that you can use is called an absolute file path. This tells you how to get to a file or directory, and it gives unambiguous directions no matter where you are on your computer, no matter what directory you're working from right now. So here's an example. Say that you are currently working in your, your home directory in a directory called R Programming for Research. So I put in here, a path to the directory that we're working on right now. If you go back and revisit the slides from the last section, you'll remember that this kind of is giving those directions on the tree for getting down to a place inside your file directory structure. So the absolute path for this would be to give that full path through the trees of different directories to get to the file. So if I wanted to get into the subdirectory data for this, the absolute file path would give all of that information and end with data. If I use a relative file path, on the other hand, I only need to tell the computer how to get there from where we are right now. So since we're already in the R programming for research uh, uh, directory in this scenario, all we need to put for the, for the relative file path is data. So this sends it in, it says it's a subdirectory of the current working directory called data. These both have advantages and disadvantages. In this class, we will be using relative path names because the, the advantages far outweigh uh, the advantages of absolute path names. And I'll explain a little bit more about that, but again, this is moving you towards those good habits of reproducibility. I am planning for all of you to be long-term R programmers, and so I think it's worth the time for you to get into these good habits that will serve you well as you move into more complex projects. So a relative path name tells you uh, which, how to get there from where you are right now, but it depends on where you are starting from. So you could run the same code, and if you have reset to a different working directory, it wouldn't work anymore. It's sensitive to where you're starting from and this idea of what your current working directory is. However, it turns out that's a good thing when you're sharing code. Because what it lets you do is if you use a directory and have all of your files below that directory, um, just like you do when you're using an R project, then you can take that whole directory and save it and send it to somebody else. And as long as they move into the working directory of that top level, they should be able to run everything exactly like they want to. For absolute path names, that's a little bit more robust on your own system because it doesn't matter where you're running it from. It gives an unambiguous path regardless of your working directory. However, nobody else that you work with will have the same file directory structure that you have on your computer. So those, that piece of code, if you have an absolute path name in it, it'll break as soon as somebody else tries to run it on their computer, and they'll have to revise that piece of the code to match the structure of their own computer. Again, I strongly recommend that you save your data file somewhere in the directory of the R project you're working on for that project so that you can think of everything as being below the working directory for the R project that you're working in. Then you can use relative path names and that, um, that R project directory becomes something very easy to share with other people and have them still be able to, to run it easily. In terms of getting around directories and structuring these file paths, there are a few abbreviations you'll sometimes see. Um, so one of them is a single dot, that stands for the current working directory. Two will get you off one, two dots will get you off one directory. And then um, 
you can use a forward slash and move up even further from that. You can even use that trick to go up and over. So this would take you up one directory from where you're currently working and then over. Another abbreviation you might find useful sometimes is the tilde. This stands for your home directory. So we can take a look at a few of those right now. I'm back in the R project on practice R. So again, if we do list.files, it lists the files in the current directory. We have a .rproj file because this is an R project and that got added when we made this into an R project. And then we also have this data subdirectory. If you'll remember from last time, if we want to do to list the files in that data subdirectory, we can do that just with the name of the subdirectory. We could also, if we wanted to, it takes more typing, but we could use that shorthand of a single dot to stand for our current working directory. So again, this is saying that we want the path to be the subdirectory of the current working directory, we put that single dot, called data. And if we run that, we see that gives the same thing. If we want to list all of the files uh, one directory up. So if you remember, I saved this in my desktop. There aren't any other files I don't think there. So all it's showing is this directory that we're getting into right now. But we could go up even one more from that. So this is saying go up one directory and then go up another directory. There you can see we're getting to the general structure for, for my file directory structure where I have access into documents or desktop or other things. And so then if I wanted to go over into one of those, so we're going up and then we're going to go down in another one, I can add in and I can we can see what's in my documents, for example. And so then it's listing everything that's in that subdirectory right now. And this is almost completely um, uh, subdirectories because you can see they don't have the file extensions with the exception of a few projects for, for filming things. So again, here's an example of using relative pathways with those abbreviations. You can again use this to go up and over if you want to get and see the see the files in a directory that is the subdirectory of the what we call the parent directory of what we're currently in. If you want to go further down in the project we were looking at, we only had one subdirectory, but you could have other subdirectories nested inside those. So you can just keep listing those with a forward slash in between each of the levels as you go down. An interesting thing about R and, and about kind of a, how we say files in general now is that when you access online files through your browser, it really is that. It is a file that is not saved on your computer, but saved somewhere else. And it turns out we can use that. You can actually read in a lot of uh, flat files if they're posted online. You can read them in directly in R without ever downloading them and saving them in a file in your computer. So let's look at an example of that. We'll look at that shipwreck data. And I'm going to pull up right now the GitHub page for this class. So again, this is at github.com, GE Anders, which is my GitHub handle, and then all of the information for the, for the, um, the code and all for the R programming book is in this R programming for research repository that I have there. So you can go in there, and one of the subdirectories is data. That has different data files, including some of the ones we've been working with. So in an earlier slide this week, we looked at this one. If we click on this, it goes through. You can see a preview of the file right here, but you can also get in and get a version of the raw file. So I can click on that. If you look up here at the path that our browser is going to, you see it ends in that dot tab. This is actually a flat file. It's saved on GitHub servers rather than our own computer, but we can actually still read it in from R with those read R functions. So I'm going to copy this whole path, and this is the file path to get to that. We're sending it to somewhere other than our computer, but it is still a, a file path that we can think of in terms of reading in the data from R. So let me clean up right here, and then we can do, let's load the reader package. And then I believe this one was a TSV, so we'll do read TSV, and then in quotation marks, 
put that file path. And in this case, you can again see it is just the, the address you're giving to your browser to get to that page of the raw data. But we did check to see it does look like instead of HTML, it's got the ending that indicates it's a flat file. So if we run that, it has run it in fine. And if we wanted to, again, we can make sure that we save it to an object. Now, the other thing here, and I'll open a script to show this, and this is just a small note, but when you do these, a lot of these are very long, and we like to make our code so that later we'll be able to go back and scroll through it and read it, and for something like this, you're having to scroll over. It gets to be a huge pain. Um, it's best practice to try to keep within 80 characters when you're scripting. So you don't have to do that scrolling. And you can actually set in RStudio to kind of show you that line when you're getting to 80 characters so that you don't run over it. And I think this 80 character limit actually goes back in the history of programming to when people did cards. They, they used these cards to put in their data or to put in their code and turn them in. And I think the limit for those was 80 characters wide. So that's a, something that's persisted. But what we can do here is we can instead use that paste zero function that we looked at just a little bit the first week to make our code shorter here. So we'll do shipwreck URL and we'll use paste zero. And now let's paste in that whole thing. Oh, I think I already had quotation marks on it. There we go. So we'll paste in just the file path. And now let's pick some natural spots and we'll put quotations in between and then the commas. Let's pick there too, maybe. So if you remember the paste zero, we'll take any of the character strings that we have and it'll stick them back together into one. So this lets us separate so that we can read things without having to scroll over, but it'll still create that same URL. So if we come down and we do the shipwreck URL now, we can use tab completion for that. You can see it stuck it all back together. And then for the read TSV, we can refer to that object instead of having to have that whole thing typed out here. And now if we look, it's got it all in there. So I've got one slide where I'm talking about this idea of doing it. And again, just as a reminder, you use paste zero, and then you can put in separate character strings that you wanna paste together. And the zero, that by default will leave no space in between. If we just used paste, then the default would have left a space in between, and that would have messed up the file path a little bit. So this is a shorthand way for us to use a separator that has no space. And then we can define that as an object name. And again, here's the example that we just ran for that, of defining that as an object, and then going through and doing the read TSV to read it in.